All right, and welcome to lecture five of the week, lecture twenty-two of or twenty-three, excuse me, of the uh, of the course, and um, what should be pretty positive will be the last lecture of week four. Um, it should get us up and ready for our um, our discussion of Jesus, which will take two weeks, beginning next week. So, where we left off is that. Israel is in a time of continual captivity or exile. They just keep getting passed from empire to empire. And so as they're, um, you know, you remember the three uh, consequences of the exile. First, that they become strict monotheists worshiping Yahweh alone, that they codify their scriptures so that they can better keep the law and not forget what led to the exile. And then they start to develop this final character, this person chosen by God, who was coming, would be sent by God, appointed by God to liberate Israel and reestablish very particularly the kingdom of David. So this goes back to the Davidic covenant. You know, God made a covenant with David that um, someone would come from his line and then establish the Davidic kingdom and it would have no end. That was the promise made to David. And so this promise, along with a bunch of others, starts to come out of their interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. And this is uh, a person who is going to be a king from the line of David. It's going to be a prophet, you know, speaking the word of God. And it's going to be a priest to liberate, or excuse me, in, uh, arbitrate between Israel and God, the ultimate priest, the ultimate prophet, and the ultimate king. And this divinely appointed person, as, 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 as Israel starts to come uh, to understand is going to liberate them from captivity, restore them from exile, and restore, reestablish and restore the kingdom of Israel to its rightful glory. All right? And so this person, of course, is the Messiah, the Mashiach, which means anointed one. All right? And so this is this chosen character, this very important character in the story of Israel, who's going to um, culminate the covenants and again fulfill um, the nation of Israel as God's chosen covenantal people and so anointed one is 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 it, it actually refers to the anointing of oil and so the anointed one or the chosen one someone is anointed when uh, their oil is put upon them and it does match up with the three kind of characters, uh, traits, or, or, or identities that the Messiah would have. Now, again, let me, uh, let me say again, there was not agreement. You know, there were, there were different people who said, no, he'll only be a king. No, he'll only be a priest. Some say there would be two Messiahs, a priest and a king. Um, there's a whole bunch of disagreement about what the Messiah is going to look like, okay? So don't think that this is just everybody has the same idea. But there are certain threads and themes that we can kind of pull out of messianic expectation. And so <clears throat> the idea of anointing, you know, is the priestly anointing of consecration, um, the kingly anointing of coronation, and then, of course, the prophetic anointing of the word of God. So this is in this way, as Messiah acts in terms of priest, king, and prophet, um, the, the Messiah is anointed for these purposes. Now, as I told, as I just said, there were multiple interpretations of Messiah. And um, some of the big ones, which are found in the scriptures, is, you know, this idea of the warlord or conqueror. So Psalm 2, right? You know, he dashes the nations with his iron scepter. Um, this righteous pastoral ruler um, who's shepherd of Israel, shepherding Israel. Um, meek and humble, you know, this is, he comes, you know, on a donkey, on a colt. You know, a little baby donkey, not really a little baby, but a young don I don't know what these terms mean. To be honest. Um, I just know donkeys are not as good as horses. So, and then of course, this is not a very popular interpretation. In fact, it might be just like not really existing at all, but that was the notion that he would be a tortured victim who atones for Israel's sin. Um, so that's there too in Isaiah 53 that he is smited for, for our sin, and in Isaiah they're speaking as Israel. Now it's the warlord interpretation that's the most popular. I mean, this was, by and large, the idea here, is that Messiah is going to come, 
and he's going to kick some ass, and he is going to just conquer and destroy all these other nations with his might and his power and um, bring Israel back into its glory. So mostly what they're seeing is a warlord um, who is uh, chosen to violently reestablish the kingdom of Israel and reestablish it as superior over all other kingdoms, ending the exile and um, freeing Israel to be uh, back in its covenant relationship with God. Now, at, by the time we get to Rome being in charge of Israel, there's an uneasy relationship here. Uh, because on the one hand, Romans aren't telling them, you know, you can't, you have to worship a certain god. You know, they're not like the Seleucids or other empires in that regard. You know, so they say, like, you go ahead, you worship your Yahweh, you do your temple sacrifices and stuff. But on the other hand, Rome, first of all, was oppressive, like all occupations in its various ways. Um... And, because, uh, I mean, you know, ruling empires, just they're just, that's what they do. They, um, they oppress other peoples and make them do their will. And, you know, like, and then tax them and take their resources and stuff like that. So there's that aspect, and that's really te keyed into this whole idea that Israel is supposed to be its own kingdom. And so Rome represents the antithesis, the opposite of what being freed and brought out of exile would be. So Rome is understood to be the enemy um, because Rome is uh, inhibiting their ability to be fully Israel. And this is part of who they're looking for, the Messiah to come along and beat Rome out, maybe destroy Rome. And um, there's another problem too, is that Roman rule inhibited them from keeping the law. Um, for example, the Sabbath, as we'll talk about when we get to Jesus, the notion of um, if someone forces you to go a mile, go with them another, what's going on behind that is that, um, I think we might have talked about this in the, in the lecture on biblical interpretation, but the idea is that a Roman soldier can force you to carry their gear for a mile. Now, Romans don't care if it's Sabbath. They don't, they don't give two hoots about uh, your laws and rules according to your religion. They don't care. And so if we give you, you, you our gear, you need to carry it a mile. Well, according to the Sabbath, it was understood that you can only go three-fifths of a mile. Um, that was, I think, the dominant interpretation. So they're being forced to break the Sabbath, i.e. break the law. Um, they can't carry out their own public discipline. That Romans don't allow that. Romans have to... Uh, they are in charge of, and this is pretty normal too for empires um, and kingdoms and, and governments today. Uh, states control violence, right? Um, this is part of what states do to maintain control of areas and, and, and regions, is they control the violence. Um, they say what violence is allowed and what violence is not, and so they control public discipline. America does this. Um, now, there's an aspect of order to it, but... Um, there's also an aspect of statecraft to it. And for Jews in this time period, this was troubling because the law demands certain kinds of, of punishments. Now, some of those are not good, obviously, like stoning. Um, and, you know, you know Christ, Jews aren't, or Jesus isn't a fan of stoning. Um, and so we'll talk about kind of how Jesus fits with the law. But... Um, the, the, the idea is they can't, they can't carry out the ordinances of the law. And then, of course, there's idolatry that comes along with Rome. Um, they're infectious, right? They're, they're seen as something that just inhibits them from being Israel to its right and fullest extent. And so they represent the continuation of exile. And so what happens is... Israel is kind of schemy about Rome. Not all of them. There are people who are in cahoots with Rome, you know, the aristocratic, aristocratic class, the Sadducees, um, people who benefit basically from Roman rule. Um, and then there are other groups like the Zealots who are planning, they're plotting to um, overthrow Rome. 
if you've ever seen The Life of Brian by Monty Python, this is so hysterical. They actually get this part of history really right in that there's all of these different factions in Israel that are conspiring to overthrow Rome somehow. Um, and it's, it's a really funny movie. Um, big Monty Python fan, but this is right. This is true that they're, 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 they're trying to take matters into their own hands. And of course they're not successful. Um, and so one of these things that would happen is when these kinds of little revolts would happen and they would happen, they oftentimes were, uh, centered around a messianic figure. Now here's what I mean by this, because this is important. Take this one to the bank. I'm going to say it again uh, throughout the lecture series on Jesus. But Jesus was not the only person to claim to be Messiah. Hear that again. Jesus was not the only person to claim to be the Messiah in Israel's history. In fact, there were many claimants to the Messiah. Now, not many in the sense that every, you know, you can't walk two blocks down the street without running into somebody saying, I'm the Messiah. It's not like that. But over, even the century um, the, of, of Jesus' life up into the second century, there are people who are proclaiming that they are Messiah and that they um, are going to overthrow Rome, throw them out, and, and, and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. So Jesus is not unique because he says he's Messiah. That's not what makes Jesus unique. Other people did that too, you know? And other people, <laughs> honestly, had more success. In, sorry about the noise. Other people had more success in doing it. Um, they ultimately would fail, like Jesus, but Jesus didn't even get a revolt going. I mean, Jesus is a really bad Messiah. He doesn't even have an army, you know, like like Thaddeus did or, or whoever. Um, so, I mean, probably the most famous Messiah outside of, of Jesus would be Simon Bar Kokhba. Um, so, Simon uh, Bar Koseva, uh, it's you know, Bar means son of. Uh, is declared to be Messiah in 132 CE or AD by Rabbi Akiva. Akiva was a very respected rabbi. Um, and so, and, and this isn't, I mean, I don't know for sure, but my guess is Simon probably believed it. He probably believed he was the Messiah. And so he led a revolt and actually knocked the Romans out of Jerusalem for a minute and began minting coins. Um, as in year one, like year one of the kingdom of Israel, okay? He's doing the Messiah work, that warlord thing, that I'm going to conquer and I'm going to reestablish Israel. And then he changes his name to Simon Bar Kokhba, which means son of the star. Rome sieges the city for three and a half years in one of the most disturbing conflicts with, in Jewish history. Um, and it's pretty bad. Um, the final, the, the sieges are just like all the ancient sieges that we've talked about, so we don't need to go through details again. But I mean, the conditions in Jerusalem would have just been horrifying. Anybody who tries to leave would have been, you know, slaughtered in terrible ways. Um, and then finally, when the Romans actually got in there, it would have been, it would have been absolutely brutal. And there was this one remnant of like 2,000 Jews that went up a, a, you know, depending on where you're from, the term mountain can be really contentious, but, um, but a kind of a, a really tall mountain or a really tall hill or a small mountain. And they were just holed up there and the Romans couldn't get to them. And so what the Romans did was they built a road. They built a, a, a descending road so they could finally get there. And when they got there, they found that the 2,000 Jews that were left over from the revolt had committed a mass suicide so that they couldn't be, you know, destroyed by the Romans, which would have been really brutal. It would have been very violent, very painful. And so at this point, all of these struggles that Rome's been having with Jerusalem and Israel, they say, this is enough. We're not dealing with revolts every 10 years from you people where messiahs would come along. Messiahs would come along and say, you know, I'm the messiah and I'm going to beat Rome. And Rome's like, we're done. We're done with this. They raise Jerusalem to the ground. They um, ban all Jews from the city. Jews are not allowed back in the Jerusalem for like centuries. 
and um, if my history is right. And they rename it Aelia uh, Capitolina, which is named after the emperor Hadrian at the time. And um, and so basically, Jerusalem is the the temple is utterly destroyed again. Um, it was there was another big revolt in seventy A.D. Uh, that we're, we'll we'll talk about a little bit, but um, this was the last one, and um, this was kind of the end of the notion of Jerusalem and Israel as a geographic area and a state until, of course, the you know the twentieth century. So this was the final dispersion. Um, no more temple and um, Rome basically ended this era of Jewish history. And Jews continued on simply as a religion of the book and synagogues and so on and so forth. Now, again, the key takeaway here, one is what the Messiah looked like for most people. The predominant understanding of the Messiah was warlord, a, 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 a powerful, violent king who would overthrow any power that uh, opposed Israel and reestablished Israel's uh, glory as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Yahweh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, right? Tuck that away. And the people who would often lead these revolts proclaim themselves to be messiahs. Now, sometimes they were bandits or just, you know, thieves or whatever. Sometimes they were, you know, more, um, they weren't, you know, necessarily criminals or something. But the thing is, is that I'm bet I'm willing to bet that unless you're a historian um, or, you know, had some really good education about biblical history, my guess is you've not even heard of Simon Bar Kokhba. Um, so you haven't heard of any person who claimed to be the Messiah in this period except one. And so if it's not that Jesus claimed to be Messiah that makes him interesting or unique in history, if other people did this, one did this in 132 AD, which led to the destruction and end of Second Temple Judaism. What is it about Jesus that means that 2,000 years later, we're still talking about this Jew, this poor Jew, like not poor, like, oh, poor, but, you know, impoverished, you know, low class Jew who led no revolt, had no army, died in a public execution, and then would you would think be just forgotten by history along with all the other messiahs that no one talks about. Why, 2,000 years later, are we in a um, in the School of Professional Studies at St. Louis University, a Jesuit university dedicated to this Messiah? What is so special about Jesus? And that's what we're going to get to next week. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture series this week, and um, I look forward to seeing you again.